is that even still too optimistic? 5.1% next year? Like, what, what, what's your forecast for Asia, in particular China? I took a quick glance at the numbers. I would say that uh, for 20, 2019, we're mostly in line, given that we're already in Q4. But then for 2020, I think that, that there is uh, some discrepancy in what, where we see things could go. For example, in China, our number is 5.7. I think the IMF just lowered it to 5.8. We think that's an encouraging move, that they are finally kind of coming in line towards where the market is. But I think achieving a 5.8 is not necessarily an easy job either. For example, for our 5.7, we are expecting that a policy Policy easing has to step up in the near future, and that's why we have our baseline there. Otherwise, they can still slip further through the crack. Were you disappointed that this week that the uh, the PBOC was going to set the new uh, prime loan rate mm -hmm. and they didn't cut it like many people in the market expected? Is the is the PBOC signaling to us that uh, people like us who are looking for more stimulus, uh, we might have to wait a while longer? Well, the PBOC were probably thinking that they have already done enough, to be honest. If we ask them, they would say, we have done so much. You know, look at the LPR from the previous months. It was lowered by 10 basis points. And look at what we have done. The total social financing growth has accelerated a little bit in September. But hey, that's an acceleration. Well, but in our view, unfortunately, we don't think they have done enough. We think that the risk is that they probably have fallen behind the curve and they need, definitely need to do more. In addition to the LPR cut, which they should have done, but they didn't, they also should cut the benchmark interest rate, which covers not just the new loans or the new lending, but also the existing lending stock. And the loan stock is the you know kind of massive quantity we're talking about, but they refuse to do that. What we think would require them to do is to wait for the moment, most likely going to happen next week, when the Politburo meeting is being held for third quarter, you know, economic policy summary, and then the president will step out and say that we need to do some adjustment. Go ahead, Mark. Can you, can you maybe explain? I see a lot of, uh, of course, with the trade conflict with the U.S., we see that as a headwind, of course, on China. But how much of this is China economy just slowing down as, as it matures? It would naturally slow down from 10 percent, 8 percent, now slowing past 6 percent. What do you think? How much of the impact is the trade and how much of it is really just China and its own evolution? This is a terrific question. I think there, is some, there are many things that are combined at the moment that really slow down such a giant economy. You have trade, but I have to say that that's more 2019 story than 2018. But it has been slowing down since March 2017. So what was it? So partly it was indeed China itself, but it wasn't all structural. Yes, structural story that more consumption, less investment is part of it. But then there was also this deleveraging effort that have been driving very hard you know, throughout you know, 2017 and early early 2018, that was really slowing down the economy. And secondly, you've got a manufacturing sector, global change, right? It isn't, isn't, you know, something that, uh, that China is the most impacted of because you have a large part of the economy that is exposed to that. I think that's, overall speaking, all are affecting the China overall economy. But we think that, after all, it can be denied that the, the, uh, the, 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 the output gap is already, you know, pretty negative, implying that our actual growth fell below our long-term potential and mm -hmm. policy easing need to step up. So we also got some headlines today from CCTV uh, that said things like China's going Im to increase imports of ag products, going to take measures to improve forex management, going to buy consumer goods, equipments, et cetera. When we see those headlines, we're like, oh, OK, maybe some steps are being made progress in China-U.S. trade talks. When you hear those headlines, what do you think? Well, I would tend to say the same thing, but uh, I probably would be a little bit more skeptical than saying that, you know, we're all good and that we're going to have never say that we're cruise, all good. you know, For sure. forever, right? <laughs> never say never. And how long are it, is it going to be, right? We don't know. Because a lot of the, the nature of the, the, the changes in this kind of uh, trade deal or phase one, phase two of such deals is that they're probably just, you know, kind of uh, checking and constantly checking and proposing and then rechecking, reassessing. So. Uh, the problem is that right now it looks like a you know 40 to 50 billion import you know on an annualized basis by the way that's a huge number we were ta we are talking about china in the past buying at most 20 billion at the peak level back in 2012 Right. So now they buy only six, seven. So if they really push it all the way up to 40 to 50, that's a big number. And I would say that could make a huge difference to the bilateral trade imbalance. But in the meantime, there are so many other more critical things that hasn't been resolved. For example, Huawei, the technology stuff, and for example, the, uh, the, the so-called the risk of delisting ADRs or asking the, uh, the U.S. companies not to invest in China-related mm -hmm. assets. I mean, you know, we have so many other things that have 
have been completely unaddressed. So how, where are we in that particular trade negotiations? I'm not so sure that phase one is already the answer. So how much do you think that this is uh, China, which has this uh, horrible uh, food inflation uh, from a, a shortage of, of, of protein, really, soy and right. meat. And so uh, importing more is out of China's own necessity rather than doing the U.S. farmers a favor, no? Well, I think it's, it, yeah, it's both. And by the way, I think trade really benefits both sides. It's definitely not just, you know, doing a U.S. a favor. It's helping China, too. Uh, what we heard is that the, the swine fever has done, done such a bad job to, uh, to the supply. It destroyed a lot of the hog supply to the extent that there is almost a surplus in soil because yeah. with the soybeans are the, the main feed. So, yeah. you know, it's because we don't have too many yeah. hogs alive.